Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to another episode of Sales TV. I am your co-host, the Bearded Sales Guy, and we have a fantastic topic to discuss today, the 2024 state of mental health in sales. And I'm joined by my co-host, Jordan Abbott, for the first time as a co-host, you were here as a guest. I was, I was indeed, and I am honoured to uh, to be welcome to, to this side of the fence as, as a host, so thank you very much for having me. And it's lovely to have you here. Looking mm -hmm. forward to, uh, to an interesting uh, discussion. So without further ado, let's bring on our guest, the founder of the Sales Health Alliance. Je Starting sales, really difficult type of environment. Was sort of early days as a seller, I was a top, a top performer, but I was struggling behind the scenes with really bad anxiety, insomnia, panic attacks, and it was after the third panic attack that put me in the hospital when wow. I realized this was not sustainable. So that was sort of like origin number one, because at that point, that's when I really started to dive into, okay, well, if sales is this high stress environment, what can I be doing to take better care of myself? And I just sort of went on this personal journey of self-growth and learning and just trying out all sorts of different mindset strategies, stress management strategies, things that I could do to take better care of myself. And then origin number two was fast forward to July of 2018. During that time, during those kind of next, I guess, eight or 10 years or so, I advanced different sales leadership roles, continue to work in sales. But it was in July of 2018 when I first first launched my sales consulting website, and three days after that, I was diagnosed with testicular cancer. So life threw this crazy curveball that I wasn't ready for, but it was sort of through that experience when I realized the same strategies I was using to take care of my mental health and sales, I naturally executed on during this next stressful period of my life. And that's when this sort of idea around mental health and sales and sales health alliance really started to take, to take shape because you guys both work in sales and it's, you know, you anyone I share this statement with, it resonates with them, which is anxiety in sales is not optional. It's really part of everyday life. And when things become overwhelming and we become stressed or we're unable to manage all the different tasks that we have to do on a regular basis, our mental performance starts to decline. So how do we sh change the lens of this topic less around this doom and gloom type of perspective and shift it more towards treating sellers like corporate athletes who when they learn how to maximize their mental performance, they work on their inner game, they know how to build that resilient mindset, they're able to show up more consistently and perform their best every single day. And yeah. it's been five years since, uh, just over five years now since, since Sales Health Alliance started. And it's been cool to see the work of helping over 10,000 sellers at this point really enhance their mental performance and learn the tools and the strategies to really thrive under pressure in a high pressure sales role. Yeah, yeah, it's a great mission. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great story. I mean, it's, it's great that you can talk about it now, but um, being hospitalized because of anxiety and three panic mm -hmm. attacks, that, that does not sound like fun to me. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and then getting cancer. So you, you've been through a lot and now you're, now you're eliminating, I kind of see you and feel you're li trying to el eliminate poor mental health from sales which is something mm -hmm. that I hold quite close to, to my heart. Um, mm -hmm. I know, Jordan, I want to bring you in at this point because, um, uh, you know, when we started working together professionally, uh, what, three years ago now? A uh, little bit longer. Little probably bit. about, yeah, four, four years ago. Yeah. Pushing. You, you didn't enjoy sales in the beginning. Can you, t <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So I, I uh, similarly to you, Jeff, I worked in telesales for a period, um, moved into field sales, door to door, commission only. So that sort of taught me a lot, um, mainly how not to sell, in all honesty. Mm -hmm. um, but then when we actually started working together in a, in a more complex B2B sales environment, I thought it would be a lot different. Um, I thought it would be a lot more professional. I thought it would, I, I don't know really what I expected, but I thought, thought it would be different. And uh, it was just the same story again, very high pressure, feeling like I was banging my head against the wall, doing these tasks, taping a telephone to my head, sending out a ton of tailored emails and just not getting the results that I wanted or desired. 
And it was to the point where I thought, well, sales isn't for me. Um, yeah. And it, it was a real close call to, to actually leave in the profession. And it was only when we shifted our approach. Well, before you, before you go on to the turning point, yeah. I should add, you were working for me. So the pressure wasn't necessarily coming from me. It was coming from the pressure you were putting on yourself. Yeah. And the yeah. pressure you were getting from uh, what you were doing, just not working anymore. Yeah, indeed. I, I was in a, in a very fortunate position, given that, you know, I had you as, as that North Star, that guiding light, that mentor to help me through. But, but still, I think everyone wants to do well. Everyone wants to do better. So mm -hmm. that pressure sort of is inherent almost, particularly in, in salespeople, I think. Yeah. And the turning point for you then? So the turning point was we, we changed our approach. Mm -hmm. And I think the biggest thing was it was fulfillment, really. My mindset shifted from one of where I, I felt I needed to fill this corporate mold to one where I could just be myself, be more authentic. And it, it worked for me in terms of my, my mental health, but also in terms of performance. Um, mm. my, my performance increased by 6.7x in terms of the amount of calls that I could, net new meetings, should I say, that, that I could book. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was a real turning point. Yeah. And you're a creative at heart, so you were able to kind of spread your wings in that department. Yeah, certainly. If, yeah. if anyone's seen some of my content, I <laughs> essentially make a tit out of myself uh, <laughs> doing parody music videos, etc. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And they yeah. are very amusing. Indeed. Yeah, yeah. But uh, let, let's... I was, yeah. just gonna, I was just going to say, I think you touched on something like really interesting there, which is like, I still go back to that book that was written probably 10, 12 years ago now, that book, Predictable Revenue, which became just like the must-read book for for sales organizations everywhere. Like, how do you create predictable revenue? And I think from there, we kind of uncovered this idea of like, how do we engineer emotions and authenticity and individualism out of sales into sort of these like parts that we can plug and play? But it sounds like you experienced sort of the worst side of that, which is common within sales when it's like, you're being forced into a box and you're being forced into someone you aren't who truly are every single day like it's just like it absolutely pushes you towards burnout and fatigue and there's so much value in leaning into who we are authentically being able to use our strengths on a daily basis doing activities that are energy gaining instead of energy draining so it's like it's interesting that you shared that story because I, I hear that a lot from sellers is this like trying to fit into this mold of who I should be versus really leaning into who I actually am and playing to your strengths on a regular basis and you know who you actually are. Yeah, yeah, indeed. So let's come on to the uh, to the report because um, there's some good stuff in here, uh, mm -hmm. and and I I do feel slightly honoured that you've launched. The analysis today the day where mm -hmm. you're, you're appearing on on sales tv i don't know if that was by design but uh, we are very grateful for that you're joining us today jeff um where would you like to start there's 27 pages in here yeah i think maybe just like the first two pages is kind of like a good sort of baseline to start um so if you can pull the the slide the first slide up i think that'll be kind of a really good starting point just to help people get context of what this report has captured. So this data was captured between, um, I think it was October and November of last year, and we captured just over 500 responses. And this was sort of the breakdown that we, we see. And when we think about the percentage that really stands out is 70% of sellers are struggling with their mental health. So those are sellers that who rated their mental health as fair or poor. And yeah. The reason why this is troubling, and if you want to kind of flip to the next slide, is I've been in the fortunate position to be able to be doing very similar reports like this every single year. Last year, I think we had about 700 responses. The year before that, we had about 800 responses. So, you know, thousands of sellers have gone through this as well as like the work that I've done externally. And you can just see how challenging and 
worrying this trend is, if you think about going from 43% to 58% to 63% to now yeah. 70% of sellers are struggling with their mental health, like that's almost three quarters of sellers that are struggling with their mental performance. And in an industry that cares so much about performance and high performance, we're just getting so many things wrong, especially when you look at sort of 20, 2020 and 2021 there at the peak of COVID, like things have not improved given what yeah. was probably one of the most challenging times in, you know, human history or in at least our lives that we'll ever have to go through. Things are only getting worse. Yeah. So be curious to, to hear from you guys this day, like when you see this data, like how does, what resonates with you here from, from this stuff? Yeah, I, I think for me that what's standing out is the fact that this is, this is an endemic. It's progressively getting worse year after year and we can't blame COVID anymore. You know, this mm -hmm. seems to be here to stay. And, you know, I, I, t I talk a lot about the fact that the traditional sales funnel is, is broken. You know, we can mm -hmm. no longer, you know, try and force prospects through the funnel, into the top of the funnel, and expect our salespeople to close the same number of deals they did before when all buyers are doing is, is, is running for the hills hiding behind the, the zone of resistance because they don't want to be sold to yeah. yet, mm -hmm. yet, you know, yet business leaders are telling sales, sales people do more with less, make more mm -hmm. calls, send more emails. Oh, now we've got AI. Let's use AI to send more emails. And it's not actually solving the root cause of the problem in my mind. No, mm -hmm. not so just, just on that point of really, pushing salespeople to push their prospects down that rabbit hole. The the number of conversations I had last year with people in a new business um, role that were completely unhappy, completely unfulfilled with the role, and were looking to move into an account management or a customer success role mm -hmm. um, because they were just sick of having to force prospects that potentially were unqualified, potentially weren't a good fit down that role just to, to try and get close to the number. Mm. Um, and what I think will be interesting over the next year is given the switch of focus for a lot of businesses to expansion efforts, whether we're going to see that increase in stress levels um, yeah. shown, shown throughout the, the findings. Yeah, I noticed this year, uh, or this time, I should say, Jeff, you've you've brought customer success into the into the study, into the research, and to mm -hmm. Jordan's point, uh, you know, there's certainly a move. It seems towards unearthing revenue from existing customers to find the growth that businesses need. Mm -hmm. um, um, so tell us what, why, why, why have you included customer success this time? What's your thinking there? I think like I think where we get a lot of things wrong, and you can toss the next slide up, which kind of shows the breakdown of, of roles. But I think why customer success is important to include, and, and why we get a lot of sort of the mental health conversation wrong, just in general, is we typically default to HR, and this is sort of houses like HR is responsible for mental health within our organization. And the biggest mistake that they make is they then approach the mental health conversation, treating it as their organization as a collective whole, which is leading to general solutions. Like they buy a meditation app or they invest into some EAP program, as opposed to realizing that each, or as opposed to realizing that sort of the best way to approach this is treating each department as their own individual kind of piece that is facing their own unique stressors within those roles. So. The stressors that a frontline sales manager might make are going to be different than an AE and an SDR and a customer success and someone working in operations versus someone working in legal. Like you can't have general solutions. And the thing that really matters is putting context around why certain strategies work and connecting that to the various stressors that a seller or someone in customer success or a leader faces so that they understand why this sort of strategy or why this sort of investment is important and how it's going to help them perform in their role. But I think to your point, one of the most troubling trends that I see is like 
if you see across all of the different roles that are listed in front of you, every single role except for sales leaders and executive leadership has increased by a certain percentage from last year. So sales leadership and executive leaders is the only one that decreased. Now, it's not by much, but when I see that, I get concerned because this could be the sign of a much bigger problem starting to arise in the sense that the ability for a sales leader to understand how challenging it is to be an AE or an SDR right now, their perspective on what's stressful is decreasing while an individual seller's perspective is increasing. Mm. And a part of a lot of that has to do, I think, with sales leaders today being unwilling to lean in and understand what's going on with millennials, what's going on with Gen Zs, what's actually happening. Because I was in a mental health convers uh, in a private mental health group, and something I realized a uh, person shared was she's a Gen Zer, she's new into the environment, and she said within her group of three or four friends, they've collectively been laid off ten times within within a two year period. Yeah, so if it's you like think become the norm. <laughs> Yeah, that's become the norm. And if you think about what's happening, that the stressors, the lack of trust that new hires are coming in, like this gap is going to continue to widen. And if I put myself in a Gen Z or shoes where or even as a millennial, I feel this right now is like unaffordable housing, uncertain market conditions, wars raging around the world, climate change. Like there are these external stressors. Society is in a period of intense change where the volatility, the uncertainty, the complexity and the amb ambiguity it is increasing at an extreme rate, and that is going to have a direct impact on an individual's mental performance and mental health. And if a leader is operating from the perspective that, oh, the younger generations are snowflakes, or they're too emotional, or they're too mm -hmm. sensitive, like you're contributing to the problem of being unwilling to get curious and say, well, what's actually happening in their lives because i guarantee if you are a 50 year old sales leader right now and if you were 25 and you were back in what's happening today you sure as shit would be showing up in that percentage of sellers that are really really struggling right now and you have mm -hmm. to be willing to lean into this conversation even if you, even if you don't care about people if you care about revenue this is the most important growth metric that you can focus on yeah wow. i agree how can sales leaders start that conversation with with their sales force? So I think that's a, a good segue into sort of the next next slide if you want to pull it up. And I think it's understanding that there's a problem. When you think about the word mental health, the internal definition that anyone in, in, in society, the vast majority think mental health, they think highly anxious, they think they think someone who's depressed, someone that's about to go on stress leave. And what they fail to realize is that mental health does not equal mental illness. Those internal definitions of mental health are much closer yeah. to mental illness. And what we have to realize is that mental health is directly correlated with mental performance. It's a spectrum of well-being that we're fluctuating along every single day. And mental health isn't something you have or don't have. It applies to literally every single person, you as a leader, every single rep on your team, Everyone is just showing up at different parts on these spectrums. And what this data is showing is that 70% of sellers are in this fair and poor stage. And your goal as a leader is to change this dialogue and shift it towards, well, I want my team to be mentally healthy. How do I move them towards a state in which they're excellent and very good? Because if you think about where high performance comes from, but more importantly, where it is consistent performance comes from, it's being able to mitigate how much fluctuation happens up and down the mental health spectrum. Do you have that mental resilience where if something happens and you show up very good to stay in very good, you can buffer stress, or is your team very fragile? Are they operating under high stress where one day they have a very good day or they're showing up in a very good state? But something happens and they lack the skill set to be able to mitigate that. And over the next period of a few days or a few weeks, that person is now down to a state where they're fair or poor. So it's 
understanding that consistent performance is all about mitigating how much fluctuation happens up and down these mental health spectrums and giving your team the toolkits, creating psychological safety that will help pull the majority of your team closer to these states in which they're very good and excellent on a regular basis. That's what we have to change as leaders, not as something you want to sweep under the rug, but say, hey, there's this massive problem and we need to focus this from a mental performance lens and connect it to revenue generating our opportunities that we're so focused on achieving every single month, quarter and, and year. Yeah. Yeah. It, no, this is really interesting stuff and I'm conscious we're fast running out of time mm -hmm. and uh, we, can def we, we could definitely continue. There's an interesting comment here from, uh, from Gail uh, Karach, if I've spelt, uh, pronounced your name correctly, Gail. Apologies if not. Um, uh, Jordan, you're a millennial. Um, uh, Jeff, do you have any thoughts on what Gail is saying here in terms of the millennial generation getting it right in the workplace today overall? Is there anything from the data that suggests that? Because from what I'm seeing, it doesn't look like a great story. Yeah, I think I think we're still in this transition period where I think there's there's opportunities for more leaders to kind of really lean in. I think millennials are still in this position where they're in leadership positions, but they're not high enough in leadership positions where they can start to challenge and break them out, break the mold. Like I think a good slide would be to look at might be uh, if you scroll down two, two more slides from this one. So you can just see just how challenging this, this data is. So this is just looking at the environment in general. And the way you want to kind of look at this data is the statement that you want to know is among sellers who are working in very supportive environments. So this is this far right column, 78% rated their mental health as good or better. When sellers are working in highly toxic environments, only 8% rate their mental health as good, but 0% describing it as better. Mm. The challenging part is when I looked at the data, only 28% of sellers say that they're working in a supportive or very supportive environment. So only 28% are showing up in those far right columns. So the environment piece Everyone is in toxic or highly toxic environments. The vast majority of sellers are operating here. So this is showing to me that millennials, the people that care about this topic, aren't in environments where they feel like they're able to make a change because senior leadership is still breeding toxicity across the board. And I know this because if you scroll down a couple more slides, this will be kind of a, another important one to the, with the comparison data, of the there's like a table there so when i sort of think about sort of mental performance it really comes down to how do you build environments that are able to buffer stress so these are the 13 core areas that i focus on so everything from career pathing to achievable sales targets to is, does work feel meaningful do you have boundaries do you believe in the vision so when you think about buffering stress these are core needs that need to be provided to a seller from an environmental standpoint that allows them to buffer stress and mitigate the impact of their roles. And the really scary thing to see is just how, how, how just how much this is regressed. So if you look at this, the data, so if you take a look at clear career pathing, yeah. what you'll see is 55% strongly disagreed or disagreed that they felt like they had clear career pathing in their role last year. Yeah. This is up. 13% than last year. And we're up across the board. And this is just showing just how big a regression that we've taken yeah. as leaders in terms of the cultures and the environments that we're building, that more and more people are disagreeing that these core needs are being met, yeah. being less able to buffer stress, and it's having an impact on mental health and you see, performance. You see, to me, that says um, there's some fundamental issues that need to be fixed, whilst well-being days and efforts to improve well-being in the workplace are important. What's more important is making sure that sales teams have clarity and direction in their career path and they, and they feel like their sales targets are achievable. 
Yeah, and again, these are just going back to Jordan's comment earlier, like what can leaders do? Like these 13 core needs that are outlined in the report, this is a great starting point yeah. because most of them are free. Like you said, are they setting achievable sales targets? Are they providing ongoing career path and clarity? Are they, you know, leading with an inspiring mission and a vision of the company? Are they providing job security? So if you've just gone through a state in which a lot of team members have been laid off, one thing that I've seen work extremely well, they can help rebuild trust very quickly, is announce a firing freeze. I heard a company do that and every person on that team was like, okay, they went through the cuts, business is business, you had to make some of these cuts, like you sometimes just have to do that. But when you announce a firing freeze saying we're not firing anyone else, that allows everyone that's remaining to feel safe, to start to mm. rebuild trust, being like, this is our team, this is what we have going forward. How do I work with the people? How do I get better? How do I develop myself? How do I develop others to get through this next rough patch that we're going through with the smaller team? So again, there's some very basic free things that you can do to help a seller buffer stress and create an environment that prioritizes psychological safety that isn't involved with like lowering, lowering your expectations or lowering your standards. Yeah. It's, these are things that will contribute to better performance. Brilliant. This is great stuff, Jeff. We're going to have to call it, I'm afraid. We are out of time. Mm -hmm. where, where can people find you to learn, learn more? Yeah, I mean, definitely check me out on LinkedIn. So just Jeff Risley. I post content every single day for the most part to around this topic with different strategies. But then there's saleshealthalliance.com um, as sort of where sort of the brand lives. But the other thing that I've launched recently is called Project Mamba, which is a mental performance community for sellers and leaders. I yeah. appreciate you being in there, Alex. But yeah. again, that's a dedicated space to building high performing sellers. Yeah, and there is some great stuff in there. I've been a member for for a while. Uh, it is incredibly valuable. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's the price of a cup of coffee for a subscription. Mm. It's definitely definitely worth it, even if it's just for the breathing exercises. Um, thank you, Jeff. <laughs> um, now there are some un unanswered questions in the chat. So can I ask you to maybe take a look on the LinkedIn posts uh, after the show? And there's there's Bob. Uh, asking a question, Matthew, Nicole, um, sorry we didn't have time to get to your uh, questions, Bob and Matthew. Um, thank you, Jeff. Great session. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, All right. Glad to be here. Fantastic. Until next time on Sales TV, we'll see you next week. Have a great rest of the week.